Hey, howdy, hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. What's up, y'all? How's it going, everybody? <laughs> you guys got you guys you got to work on it. I will say, uh, the y'all is is better than the you know what would you say? Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm workshopping some stuff. I I couldn't come up with anything though. Okay, yeah. I think Mike is <laughs> When does the focus going. group meet again? <laughs> <laughs> is that is that this uh this wednesday what was it <laughs> what? i couldn't hear <laughs> too many people laughing <laughs> too many people laughing well uh amongst the three of us too many people are laughing uh amongst the uh the listeners who knows um let's see here i will say if you are listening live um I will say, if you are listening, if you are listening live, you uh, can ask your questions in the chat. Just start the uh, comment section of the the video there. Uh, just uh, click on that little uh, comment button, and you can you can ask your comments. You can see other people's comments, and uh, even see some responses from us as we go through. Uh, I want to say uh, today's show, like the last uh, 3,476 shows over the past 15, 16 years, uh, is sponsored by our good friend John Blickman at Blickman Engineering. You can check them out at BlickmanEngineering.com. And uh, they have everything from, you know, your 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 sturdy, more basic, uh, you know, uh, kettles and pots and homebrew equipment up to, you know, commercial gear. Uh, in fact, one of the new uh, cool uh, piece of commercial gear they make is this tall boy fermenter, which is uh, three and a half barrels. And it uh, is made narrow enough to go through a doorway, a 36 inch doorway. So it makes it easy. You know, you're a lot of times when you're setting up a new brewery, you don't have a lot of options for uh, buildings and things like that. And, you know, you know, it's cool taproom space, but not a great brewery space. You know, uh, uh, for metal like this, you can shoehorn in uh, to a lot of tight little spaces. So it's made a little skinnier, a little taller, uh, which means you can get more of them into a space. Uh, the uh, All the outlets and stuff are on the front. So you don't have to, you can tuck them in real tight to the wall, maximize your space. I tell everybody this when they're opening a new brewery, you pay for, uh, you know, every inch of floor space in the building. The vertical space is free, you know. So, you know, they don't they don't uh, write leases by you know cubic uh, cubic feet. They write it by square feet. So, uh, you know, skinnier, taller fermenters are uh, you know a godsend uh, to to brewers. So uh, check them out. Uh, tall boy fermenter, every, like everything uh, Blickman makes, uh, you know, he puts his uh, his uh, uh, word behind everything, and uh, you know they are they are quality quality goods. So check them out if you are into that, or your home brewer who is brewing just slightly over the uh, the uh, allowed uh, two hundred gallons a year, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, BlickmanEngineering.com. <laughs> All right. How are you guys doing? Doing all right? Travis, doing you've well. been doing some traveling. Uh, for work, for work, yeah. Utah, you know, you know beautiful Utah. You got any good I beers in Utah? Ah, so they're really good at making small beer, as you might imagine. Because, mm -hmm. if, you know, they don't have to make exclusively small beer, but you, you find small beers on tap. And right. they have guest taps, like from Oscar Blues and, and Stone and stuff. And the local guys, I think, are blowing them out of the water. Oh yeah, that's all they can do. Because they go up to you know four percent ABV. It's three point two by by weight, uh, and you can do a lot with four percent ABV. And yeah, in Utah they do miraculous things with that. I think the the rule is, although they've been changing the laws, uh, if you want to sell it on draft, um, no higher than four percent ABV. Yeah, if I think they go just a touch higher there. I don't, you, I don't know uh, yeah. If you want to, at least this is the way it used to be, if you want to brew something stronger than that, uh, what you have to do is bottle it, sell it to the government store, 
then they sell it back to you and then you can sell it to your customers. <laughs> Wonderful business model. I don't know. You know governments. Yeah. yeah. What are you going to do? Um, but yeah, just some of the most uh, amazing beers out there. Uh, who was it? Uh, what's her name? Uh, Jennifer Talley uh, at, um, oh, what was the place? Uh, she just fantastic brewer. And I tell you, some of those, those beers, um, just amazing. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of lower ABV beers. Uh, you know, it's, you know, I love uh, going to uh, England, you know, enjoying all the, the low ABV beers there. So, uh, you know, getting them at, uh, in Utah, fantastic. You, did you have a chance to of course you had time to go. I know you. <laughs> you weren't working, you were drinking. <laughs> uh, there, there's a pizza joint in town. Yeah. Uh, and and I get I get exclusively the taps. I'm trying to get all the local beer I can. Mm -hmm. But their bottle selection would rival almost any place in the country. Hmm. Uh, I mean what's the name of that place? It's a pizza place. I'll get the name to you later. Uh, <laughs> a pizza place. <laughs> Just Google a pizza place. I'm sure you'll find it. There you go. And and, and in, I mean, they have like 15% stouts in the bottles, and they have right. Belgians and Germans. You name it. Yeah. Bottles. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. The stuff. first the first place I had Spaten Optimator was in Utah. Really. And so the the software I was developing, um, the the user they they the users created their own user conference. It was an alternative to the big high money one that Macromedia always did. And I think the first couple of years was in um, uh, in Utah at uh, Snow, Snowbird. Is that the name of it? Snow? Uh, it's a ski resort, famous ski resort in Utah. And so I remember in there, went to the bar and they had like spot and optimator and a couple other things. So I'm like, Oh, I'll, I'll have that. And he goes, well, like, you know, you have to be a member of the club or something. You had to be like a resort member. So it cost you a buck. And then you were part of the, the, the membership and then you could buy all the high alcohol stuff you wanted. So I got myself pretty hammered <clears> on <throat> optimator. Uh, back then. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, how about you, Michael, you doing any traveling? um getting out i think the last time we did a show that was last may not too much just uh working yeah i've been getting actually heavy i've been the process engineer out at uh, the wastewater the, our regional wastewater plant so i've been really getting into the deep dive on some of that stuff to help them out so it's been exciting i guess from an engineer's perspective so <laughs> yeah what a nerd <laughs> but, all right no, no. yeah let's jump right into the, some questions here and reminder if you're listening live just go to the facebook page go to that, that look find our video where we're live click on the comment section comment there away with your questions or you know whatever comments you have and we'll see those and uh if we can we'll answer them uh, for you live uh, let's see here. Brendan, he says, uh, I'm repitching yeast from a slurry that was harvested over two weeks ago. What is the best way to ensure I'm pitching enough healthy yeast? For example, if I need 400 billion cells for fermentation, should I, one, take 100 billion cells from my slurry and do a larger starter, a 3.75 liter starter, or number two, take 300 billion cells from my slurry and do a smaller starter, one liter. Thanks, Brendan. See, this is I, really good, really good job with the question there, Brendan. You know, uh, nice and nice and clear and uh, uh, nice and nice and succinct bulleted points. <laughs> Gave me options, one or two. <laughs> yeah. Multiple choice. All right, what uh, what say ye, uh, guys? Which one? Which one would you pick, Michael? Well, uh, based on the age, 
I would think he'd be fine doing the bigger starter or that. I mean, the smaller starter with more cells. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just think two weeks, you should still be pretty viable. I was curious how he's measuring 300 versus 100. Is he just doing it by weight or is he kind of just estimating? I would say the Mr. Multi pitching rate calculator, which gives you an idea from the mills (laughs) to use. (laughs) Uh, the only thing I said is, uh, for me, I don't usually do starters less than two liters, and that's for a two hundred billion dollar, a two hundred billion cell, billion dollars. He, no, uh, he works in government stuff. That's why he's throwing around two hundred billion dollars. Uh, I guess, no. but uh, yeah, I wouldn't make a starter that little. Um, so I, just because I, I was, I, from what I've read and, and experienced, it doesn't really do a whole lot. I guess, you know, it's, right. Maybe just re, 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 revitalizing, I guess, is what you would do. Yeah. Yeah. Too small a starter could be an issue. What about you, Travis? That's what I was thinking. I would go for the, the larger starter personally. Uh, for one, I use your calculator a whole lot. I've got a lot of notes. And I, I don't feel like a partial growth up. I mean, going from 300 to 400, was it? That's not even a full growth up. Right. And you know, just brewing beer. Should you actually be able to get all your yeast back, you're going to get about 4x from that. So with starter, you should easily be able to get right at 4x. And right. so that's, that's much more controllable to me. And mm-hmm. that's, that's why I would go for that, not try to put a little bit of word in there and kind of wake it up. I mean, I do that on brew day, but I don't do that as a starter. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I see that. Uh, it's interesting. You, you both have logical reasons why you would go with one <laughs> over the other. And we're wrong. Um, yeah, and, you know, two weeks... <laughs> Two weeks old, still pretty young. Um, depends on what yeast it is. Some yeast dies out really quick in storage. Some yeast, um, you know, lasts lasts almost forever. So it'll depend on the strain. But I I would maybe throw out you know a third option, which is so he needs four hundred billion. I would take you know four hundred uh, the four hundred billion using the pitching rate calculator. And um, I would just, you know, wake it up that day, like Travis was mentioning, um, you know, put it in a liter or whatever and just get it going or however much I I wanted to throw into my my beer, depending on the volume of beer. Um, And I imagine, you know, it would get active uh, pretty good if it's only two weeks old. So that would that would be that'd probably be the way I would do it. You know, two weeks out, um, like Michael was saying, you know, like Travis was saying, you know, day of, um, I, I start it, you know, in the morning um, or even a little later in the day if it was uh, not too, uh, not too uh, uh, old because it'll, it'll crack off pretty quick. So, yeah, good question, Bren. Um I'm sure, you know, we got to that. That was a 2014 question, but uh, hey, we are on top of the new questions. We're, we're getting into them uh, very quickly and uh, it's staying, staying up on, which is what we'll do uh, after a real quick break. We'll be back right after this. All right, we're back. Oh, let's see here. Uh, let's see, uh, Matt, uh, Matthew was, uh, asking, I've heard surrogate projects against, protects against, uh, oxidation later in the beer life. What is the mechanism compound with the surrogate that does this? And can we replicate this without making surrogate? Anybody? I'd have to uh, do some Google search to catch up on that. I've never even heard of sour goot. Sorry. <laughs> it's a supply of soured wort that is used to sour beer. Non-alcoholic oh, yeah. fermented barley malt extract that can be used to adjust the pH of mash and wort during beer production. Uh, it is a natural ingredient that can be used by German brewing purists. It can also help extract zinc from the malt, which is a nutrient for yeast and helps with the beer's body and foam. Uh, it's topped up with fresh wort each time some is used to sour a beer. Fresh wort is soured by the lactobacillus in the remaining wort. 
that um, off based off of that. Kind of like a sourdough starter, except for sour beer. I guess uh, in my show prep, I was listening to the for the low do stuff. I was listening to podcasts where you guys interviewed Charlie Banforth, and he was talking about oxidation in the brew house and oxidation of packaged beer and and whatnot. And I mean, we can get into it more, but for me, it, it it made a lot of sense that you focused on the the two biggest contributors to oxidation and staling in beer, and that's package do and temperature. And then everything else, I mean, if you end up any with any reason that that's not good enough, then you can look at other things like this. So mm-hmm. There are some other staling compounds and, right. and uh, you know, thermal load and all that uh, has an impact as well. Because um, there is staling, non, non-oxygen staling as well uh, to worry about. Um, so Matt Matthew's saying it's the Reinheitsgebot way of achieving a lower mash pH. Um, acid malt is too, um, uh, which is what probably most people do, but uh, certainly you could do it that way. And I, I it might be even a better way of. Um, I, I, so if you're adding it in the mash, uh, is the is the theory. Matthew, that um, adding in the mash protects against uh, oxidation he's, later in beer life? I think he's saying you add it. But, uh, so I, I have a theory based on a very old brew strong yes. where I believe you told me that lactobacillus uh, decreased the color of oxidized work. Uh, Brett, the yeah, Brett, so Brett. Brett. well, yeah. So perhaps there's Brett in sour goods as well. Uh, right. If uh, even I, I would imagine anything. Um, almost, I, I imagine anything that can, um, you know, consume any oxidized sugar, uh, would result in in that kind of behavior, and would. Would also, and I would think anything, anything that uh, has aerobic uh, needs uh, would, in a way, protect a packaged beer from uh, oxidation. Would help with staling because, uh, you know, it's going to consume some of that that oxygen that that uh, you might be worried about. Uh, I was I was going to throw another thing in there too. In that same podcast with Danforth, he mentioned about you know after brew day, you know a good healthy fermentation goes a long way to yeah to cleaning up those those uh, precursors for staling and oxidation. So absolutely, yeah, that that um, healthy rich. Fermentation. So Matthew is saying it's it's added to the mash, and I've read that it protects it quote protects against oxidation end quote. I haven't investigated if it's hot side or cold side protection. I, I don't think it would do anything um, as far as that goes. Um, you're adding it to the mash, uh, which is, you know, going to be in the, you know, 150 to, you know, 160 range Fahrenheit and kill, uh, it off, right? kill off many of the, the bacteria and things like that. It won't kill off everything, but it kill off quite a bit. And then, if not that in the boil, it's going to kill that off. So I, I don't know where that's written, but I would take that with a huge grain of salt. Um, for me, I, I don't, I don't know if that's true. Um, here's another, another tricky one. Now, God bless, uh, Clint. He, he wrote in, uh, and he gave, he gave me the specific episode. He did not give me a timestamp in there, so I had to listen to the whole episode of myself talking, which uh, is not not my favorite thing to do. Uh, he says, hi there. I just finished listening to Bruce Strong, Yeast Esters, uh, October 10th, uh, 2016 episode. I was wondering if you are having any updates on the amino acids experiment you were talking about doing at the AHA rally at Heretic. Uh, I'm very interested to hear if you had any findings on this, if you could get back to me in regards to this, whether you quote this episode 
uh, you might have mentioned results on or actually have a written review on this. This would be great. Cheers, Clint. And then uh, Chris, he wrote, hi, Bruce Strong. Slowly catching up with the podcast on my drive to work. And I've recently listened to your episode around yeast esters and where you have mentioned an experiment looking at flavors generated from various amino acids. Have you completed this experiment? If so, can you say what you found? Big fan of the show, Chris. Well, uh, Clint and Chris, um, <laughs> the interesting thing is, uh, I think John uh, Palmer said that he would he would do some experiments. And... Uh, I pretty much uh, went, oh, yeah, all right, that sounds great. This is, you know, I, I think I came up with the idea of doing some experiments, and John's like, that's a great idea. Well, I'll do that. So um, I emailed John just recently after listening to the show and said, hey, we said we would do this. Um, you know, how about, uh, how, I said, you know, come up with a list of amino acids and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll run some tests. Or I'm thinking, Oh, I'll get Travis and Michael to run some tests. Um, and I, I, I didn't wait for, uh, I didn't wait for John to respond. I started looking at what amino acids I could get in pure form from uh, Amazon. And I found quite a few. Um, let's see here. Uh, I found um, valine. Uh, glutamine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine, uh, lal um, which um, it's quite interesting. Um, I also found a paper. Uh, amino acid permeases in their influence on flavor compounds in beer. Uh, it is from Brewing Science, September, October 2014, volume 67, page 120. Um, I clearly was able to get it from the internet, and uh, so should you. It's fascinating reading, and it talks about the the flavors that are created by these compounds, by these amino acids, and the preference and, and the mechanism of yeast and how they, um, you know, will turn off one. There's there's a uh, a priority, and they put them in a you know there's a group A, group B, group C, group D of uh, the amino acids, and which ones. Are the easiest for them to use that they use first, and and there's quite a bit of amino acids in in a in a malt wort, all malt wort. So, unless you mess with this, uh, you know I'm not sure um, w at what level this would kick in. So if you're doing like a lower gravity wort, would this really matter at all? It may just be more important in higher gravity worts. So we'll have to do some tests on that too. And it may be higher gravity words, you know, they utilize all the more assimilable amino acids first. And then, you know, you are providing these other amino acids, they'll start to use those and will it change it'll change the flavor. I mean, we could get, you know, more floral, rose flavors, we get more fruity flavors, we can get uh umami um you know character i think uh the the tryptophan maybe is the one that gives you kind of an umami i mean if you were trying to get that umami character in, in some of the beers it's kind of tricky and maybe this is a way that you could so um i think you know i buy the uh the amino acids i'll ship you out uh mystery powders that yeah. you won't know what they are and then you'll you'll brew these beers, and then I don't know. You'll we'll we'll have to maybe we'll ship the beers around all three of us. Yeah. And then, you know, it's got to be blind triangle test, you know, testing and see uh, what we can come up with, and maybe we'll we'll you know get some other people in on this too. But I you thought want to know why I love a, it. Yeah, I, I love it because I'll have something to blame my shitty beer on. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it's it because it's, 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 it's something nobody's really talking about. I haven't heard anywhere from anybody. Right. So this could be like the next like big, you know, who cares about files? 
We're doing protein. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, this so this can be really cool. This is a fascinating uh, topic, and um, you know, we fully intended to you know give it a go. It's just you know we're both so busy; it was very difficult. But uh, now that people have called us up on it, um, and called us out on it, we need to uh, we need to buckle down and just get it done. And yeah. um, you know, at least at least one, try. Following one of the things you said, would we have to push the limits of the yeast to really like get a yeast that's maybe only good for ten? I don't, I don't know if you can find anything lower and really push it so it, it stops and it's done and it's right. maybe only use that heavy dose. Well, and I I think it it would maybe also be affected by pitching rate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. The, the less yeast mass you provide uh, and the more they need to replicate to uh, or to bud to finish off a given wort, you know, maybe then, you know, there's, there's more cell wall building and more amino acids are needed. Um, and so, you know, maybe more of these other ones are, are taken in or maybe if you just overwhelm them with these other amino acids, they go like, Hey, there's lots of this stuff around. Yeah. Uh, that's more that's more readily available than the others. And I, you know, it may be um, you know, that availability uh, has has an effect. So there's lots yeah. of things to 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 trial here. I was I definitely think it's thinking too, it's, it's it'd be pretty straightforward, at least with one singular protein. It's make a batch, split it. I would think do something pretty plain that any flavor changes would be apparent right you know, yeah. just do a do a, a a control and then do a dose taste test send them out do whatever It'd probably be pretty apparent or not <laughs> all right let's see here uh bob is asking in the chat he says there's a lot of talk these days about how yeast starters are an outdated part of the brewing process this theory was even said to be endorsed by Chris White himself. What are your thoughts on the subject? Uh, are yeast starters still necessary when using liquid yeast on the homebrew level? Um, well, if, I, I'm seeing Chris tomorrow. We're, we're working on the next yeast book. I will ask him if he said that starters are outdated. I think, you know, it's it's very interesting to me that a lot of yeast producers, you know, not just White Labs, not just uh, uh, not just the dry yeast companies, but a lot of them are just very anti making a starter, and I'm not sure why. I think they're concerned that people are going to contaminate the starter. I think that is their their thought. They're going to contaminate it, and then they're going to blame it on the on their yeast that the beer is contaminated, but I've had a lot of beers from a lot of people that make starters and they tend to be the better beers out there. So I, I don't know why that is. Um, can, I, can I posit a theory? Sure. So if I'm making my 10 gallon batch and I don't use the starter, I have to use, I have to buy twice as much yeast. <laughs> right. But, but, but they under recommend as well. You might buy twice as much yeast when you really need four times as much yeast. Right. And, and one conversation I have often, Jamil, is like, oh, I didn't use that that calculator exactly, and, and, and my beer came out fine. Like, okay, it came out fine. Did it come out excellent? Can you make the same thing next time? Do you have control of exactly what you're doing, or did you just get – you got a good beer. And there's nothing wrong with good beer, you know? I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with good beer, but you never talk about making just good beer. You talk about making the best beer you can make, making the exact same beer over and over. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Having spent a lot of time drinking and uh, dining with, uh, I almost said something else. <laughs> I'm just, you know, you know me, I'm always joking. Um, uh, having spent a lot of time with, with a lot of these yeast folks, um, I can tell you that pretty much every one of them, at least the people I deal with, uh, want brewers to make the best beer possible that's what they're looking for they're not um I, i've never heard them go like well you know we really want them to buy more yeast 
in fact, you know, the pitching rate calculator, a lot of them were kind of upset because it suggested more yeast than they suggest, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, they don't want people to buy more yeast. They want people to make the best beer possible. And I, I, I guarantee you that, you know, their tests are showing, you know, great results from the yeast in the quantities that they suggest. The only problem I have with that is, you know, the yeast, it, you know, and, and maybe that's changed today. Um, but, you know, back in the day when I had to drive around to homebrew shops and pick up yeast, uh, you know, various homebrew shops, you know, through, throughout the area, you know, the yeast isn't always 100% fresh. And, and I've traveled to a lot of uh, homebrew shops around the world. And I can't tell you the number of times I've seen yeast sitting warm, uh, you know, outside a fridge, liquid yeast. Oh, yeah, and then dry yeast too. Wow. Uh, I've seen stores where the dry yeast is just left on the shelves. You know, it's never bad. refrigerated. And so it's not good for the yeast. And because of that, I think a starter is really an important step in validating that you have a good pitch of yeast, that it's healthy, it's ready to go. And, you know, at least I would, I'd like doing like a proofing step to see that the yeast is active. Um, That's what a smack pack's all about, right? Right, right. Uh, I will say that uh, definitely um, White Labs has doubled the amount of yeast, or not doubled, I think. Uh, 1.5. They go, yeah, 50% more yeah. uh, than, than it, it, it's, it's double what originally yeah. in the, the, the vials, the Vial. on blue, blue cap, they were 50 mil centrifuge tubes. Uh, from that, it's double from that. It's and then they raised it up to when they were doing the tubes, they increased them from I think, uh, you know, from like uh, 75 to 100 billion, and now they're like 150 billion, something like the that. New, the new next gen is uh, 215. 215, yeah, I really like using them because they're uh, right, they're really perfect for making starters, 200 bill starters. The new uh, next gen is 215. Yeah, they actually are okay. pretty neat. They have the QR code on the back and you can uh -huh. QR code and it's got the all of the testing they do. They do all the like, all um, right. they check for uh, wild yeast, they check for bacteria. They're making sure your vitality is at 99 or 95% plus. The really cool thing I saw too on their, their, their social media was, you know, compared to the vial, compared to the first pure pitch. Now this one, like you said, they're getting a lot more vitality longer it's so like at six months the pure pitch next generation two has like a 94.5 94.9 percent vitality that they're they're advertising so for me it's i, I just do starters because like uh travis was saying i want exact i want a number that's custom made for my work mm -hmm. and so i believe all the calculators and the, 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 the models are going to get me closer to that than one pouch versus two pouch versus three pouch True. I will. I will say there are certain manufacturers of yeast who won't even tell you how much yeast is in their pack. They just tell you it's enough to inoculate this right. level okay. of work. Which just, just give me the number it. and let yeah. me decide if it's enough. I can yeah. do math. So, I'm fine. So, so following what Michael's saying, following what you were saying, Jamil, it's ninety five percent when when Chris White's wonderful employees store it in the fridge. It right. may not be ninety five percent six months later at my homebrew shop. After it's shipped there and it True. sat on the counter, or maybe it was delivered on a Saturday out in the exactly. heat. Or some it's, guy. it's still, it's probably closer to 99%, uh, you know, when they yeah. package it or 100%. Um, and then, you know, like you're saying, six months down the road, the, the thing is, you know, it's still probably enough, uh, you know, because they're, 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 they're pretty resilient. And if it was handled correctly, it's still enough to do, you know, the average strength, you know, beer, and you get good results. But again, you two guys aren't looking for good results. You're looking for the greatest beer, you know, ever made on the planet every time you brew. And so, um, I mean, that's the goal, right? Otherwise, yep. you know, why, you know, why bother? Oh, you can have fun with it, you know, but um, yeah. 
Yeah. So I think, you know, a start is still an important, an important step. I think, you know, uh, Bob, I think you, you really can bypass a starter in a lot of cases. Um, it depends on, you know, if you're, if you're just having fun with, with brewing, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress about it too much. Uh, now that I'm home brewing again, I'm, I'm brewing beer. So I'm just like, well, yeah, here you go. I, yeah. I know, I know it'll be enough. I know it'll be fine. And I'm not too worried about it. You know, the beer gets consumed in like two, three hours over at, you know, Matt's, Matt's pub. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, you know, whatever, uh, you know, it'll be fine. You know, they won't care. Uh, you know, some turn out great. Some turn out good. Doesn't bother me at all. So there you go. Any, any last thoughts on that? No, I think that's it for me. So, um, Maybe where Bob got his information from, uh, if, if you go to Eastman, where it's the, the QR code brings you on the back of the pack, which mm -hmm. has been there for quite some time, but it's been more obscure and now it's very obvious. Eastman, if you tell it, I've got 1080 work, blah, 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 X gallons, it doesn't tell you starter, it tells you more packs. Now, right. it's, it's still very conservative. Right. You know, it's not Chris White trying to sell you 20 packs. Nope. It's like he, he'll still tell you one pack's fine, one pack's fine. And I say Chris's calculator. But yeah, so maybe that's why people are saying that that even Chris White is no longer telling people um, uh, that they need to have starters. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. And Jamil's going to grill him. I would almost say I'd be curious to hear if Chris White even said that. Like, I think it's well, kind of a, right. I heard maybe. So we'll see. I'm I can imagine curious. hearing him say, you know, with with the new packs, you know, starters aren't needed as much. Yeah. But um, yeah, they they asked me to my opinion on the on the calculator. I gave them a bunch of input and and they implemented every last thing I said on that. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because um if you know uh the Lalamond has the um no alcohol um or low no low alcohol uh yeast strain it only ferments uh, glucose and so it leaves all the maltose behind but they don't want to sell it to home brewers because they're concerned that a home brewer is going to make a batch that's going to be contaminated and then you know could be botulism all sorts of things but I will say this. I trust more home brewers with handling this than I do a lot of, uh, you know, commercial brewers. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've seen what people do. I've seen how contaminated yeast is in the commercial sector. Um, so I'm not sure I would trust commercial brewers with that yeast. I would, I, I mean, that, you know, if that's the concern, that's a concern. I'm, I'm actually going to interview a guy from Lala and I'll, I'll ask him about that and I'll bring that up and see, because, you know, when, if you're commercial brewing um, and you produce something that kills people, it's like, that's really bad. You put that out there in like cans and you kill, you know, a bunch of people, you make a whole bunch of people very sick. Let's probably not going to kill anybody but you can make a, a bunch of people very sick um that is something huge there's no protection against that really um and, and it, mostly insurance isn't really going to help you that much uh whereas you know you make yourself sick at home you make you, you and your and your uh your partner sick um well <laughs> well you know it's your own fault you know big warning on the pack um something like that i don't know um i mean that's... you and your buddies die we just blame it on the cult action and we'll move on <laughs> i i have an idea of maybe why it's um so if if a brewery makes a bad beer the customer is going to blame the brewery if you make a bad beer using their yeast you're gonna that's i mean true. assuming you don't understand what you did to contribute oh, to that bad beer <laughs> Uh, see this so is why Michael's gonna blame on the Bob show and go bad he, them all over town he no you picked it out 100 percent. if the brewery screws it up 
they're the buffer between you know the yeast manufacturer and the consumer right uh, i doubt it though right? lawsuits the class action well, lawsuit yeah, everybody's they always, gonna they always go down. through for the money yeah oh yeah, yeah. everybody's gonna come down you know yeah. But it would give you a little bit of bu- a buffer, whereas right. you know, consumer, you know, direct to consumer. Okay, yeah, uh, I get it. You kill one or two guys, no big deal. The brewery gets sued, <laughs> but you kill a hundred people. That's when you get the class action going. Okay, you're right. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, Garth in the chat. He asks, uh, so lads, dry hopping. So many people and so many opinions. What's your process? Ferment, de-rest, chill a little to 60 Fahrenheit, dump yeast from cone, dry hop. After 36 hours, chill to 34 Fahrenheit, dump hops after a day settling. Do you see any issues with that process? Is it worthwhile using a metabol sulfite at uh, dry hop and purging headspace a number of times with CO2? Anything else? Let me Let me jump right in here. The headspace of your fermenter at the end of fermentation has no oxygen in it. It is completely devoid of oxygen uh, because of fermentation. Um, I think uh, it, it all sounds fine. Um, the process I implemented at Heretic uh, while I was still there was... Um, to dry hop and then to recirculate the entire beer and the hops for about three hours, uh, which was a full turn of a 120 barrel fermenter. Um, and then once that was completed, uh, shutting off the pump, letting everything settle, and then dropping it. Yeah, we'd drop the yeast, jump yeast, yeah, dry hop. Um, because Stirring it up for three hours really pretty much extracts everything you want to get out of the hops and leaves behind a lot of the other less desirable things. That's one of the reasons I don't like uh, fermentation hopping. Uh, but 36 hours, again, the problem with um, cones and even, you know, carboy bottoms or a lot of cones, they you know, they concentrate everything down. And so you have a very small layer uh, exposed to the beer. And so if it's just sitting on the bottom, it's not really doing anything. Especially after you drop the yeast, you're, you know, you're real tight down on the cone. Your, your, your hops are not being exposed. And the only real exposure you get is when they, when you initially put them in and they trickle down to the bottom. Uh, so if you, if I had a homebrew conical, I would recirculate uh the beer uh until uh you know maybe for an hour or two and then uh let it settle and uh once it's settled you know dump it out and go for packaging um i don't see any any need for the metabisulfite i think you know people need to be careful about adding metabisulfite in in different uh a lot of people I, I guess, or use it for getting rid of uh, chlorine and chloramines. Um, in your hot liquor right? Sorry. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, there's all, all, already a, an issue with a lot of beers having too much sulfur to them. And, um, you know, you, you don't want to end up with a, just keeping adding, adding a lot more free sulfur, I, I would think. But uh, what do I know? I could ask you so many questions the whole show. Yes. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, for me, he basically uses my process, but I mean, and that's kind of out of the new IPA. And then what you've told me, I've actually asked you in person once way back when, but all, the only thing I do is because I don't have a pump or any way to, to, to anaerobically recirculate the beer. I just purge with CO2 at the dump valve but I don't have a stone or anything. So it's large bubbles. So I'm just trying to get agitation. I'm not stripping, at least I shouldn't be. And if I am, it's negligible, but that's my way of like, every time I charge, which I'll do two to three charges, depending on the beer style. And then I'll, I'll, I'll rouse the, the beer with, with large bubbles of CO2. I think and that's worked well for me. I think least. we should have a poll. Should Michael be stripping? 
I mean, yes. is he is he is he rousing enough? Am I rousing people with my stripping? Yes. And then and then literally you said we have to have a poll, so right. <laughs> then we have Nailed a stripper. We, we should have a stripping poll. Uh, As Michael's do you, rousing. Yes. Do you see if people are getting roused. Is, is rousing. It's <laughs> oh, uh, so we really can't so, say anything intelligent on this without somebody <laughs> bringing out the infantile uh, humor. Yeah, I set myself up. I can't. I, I get no blame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Travis. So I, I, I see. Uh, Garth's process is a summary of what I think most pros do, or along the lines of what a lot of pros do. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's at least one reason why you're dumping your yeast before you add your hops. You want to say you need that yeast. That's money. Because mm -hmm. uh, you you often have advised home brewers to go ahead and get your first dry hop in at least before the beer is finished. Now, that could just be the suspended yeast that's still in there. You could take a yeast dump still because you don't necessarily want yeast and, you, you know, hops in your yeast dump. So he's going very far away to pull a finished beer yeast out and then do his first dry hop he still has some yeast in there yeah there's uh, always there's always yeast yeah and they'll, they'll suck up the oxygen and i was going with that sucking up the oxygen right so um you've got the yeast in there to suck up the oxygen so maybe he's fretting a little bit over that um and i don't drop pop straight my my one and a half inch port conical because i can't get the hops out of the bottom of that thing mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to be a problem sooner or later. It's going to block it up. I had way more hops than that. You had four inch port. You know, Jamil went large, right? You no, in, in commercial fermenters, even the 120 barrel, they tended to be about two, you know, two and a half. Okay. Two and a half. Yeah. All right. You, you had to use some pressure to, to blast it out. So I'll say unit tank, 15 PSI max, maybe a little bit higher. A uh, hundred, I am sorry, 30 feet tall. So you yeah, got 20, that. 22 feet. Yeah, you got a seven and a half PSI from that, plus your whatever compressor of your uh yeah, you, of, of, yeah. Yeah. It, it really wouldn't take a whole lot of pressure. You know, you get, get it going. three, yeah. four PSI, and it would it would come out like you know, Plato factory. Right. <laughs> yeah. I would so say anyway. too, uh on his comment. Oh, it's already gone. Um it's for a, purging the headspace. I was thinking after. He adds his dry hops. He's worried about am I letting oxygen into the headspace there? Mm, I mean, right, what I used right. to do is I just had a little CO2 tube running on real low flow. So I got mm -hmm. the, I'm holding the tube as I pour my hops. I've never had an oxidation problem. I've actually now, I've got this guy, which has a ball lock post, and I'll run slow CO2 through that while I'm filling here. And so it's actually pushing CO2 out as I'm pouring in. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm right. like at a positive pressure, I guess you would say, inside the vessel. Yeah, even then, a, a little bit of oxygen. Yeah. You know, there's there's still yeast in there. They're gonna they're gonna take it up. It's generally not right. gonna be an issue. But uh, you know, I know people are trying to make the world's greatest beer. You know, the greatest beer the world has ever seen. And so I understand. You know, every every little bit is is interesting. Um, Garth also asks where also where is Palmer. He wandered around in a it, he wandering around in a fugue state in southern Florida. No he pants, no it. shame. Sorry. Um you did a show with him recently, I thought, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Just recently. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I I first off, we explained that he got seriously injured in a uh, one of those uh, body suit uh, skydiving things. But yeah, the squirrel uh, that turned out that. not to be factual. <laughs> and then uh you know uh palmer's palmer's uh doing a technical review or editorial review of uh editorial review of uh some articles for uh the the uh, uh master uh brewers uh, the mbaa mbaa yes thank you hey can we get some guest subscriptions for that system since since we're sitting in for him oh I, I wonder uh, you might be able to. Um, if you're like a university student, you get a really <laughs> discounted one. Oh uh, wow! 
I, I, uh, I don't think I can get into the heretic one anymore. Um, although I don't know that they're using it. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Garth also asks, uh, research how? Peristaltic pump? I'm not sure about how to do this on the homebrew level. Yeah, I would suggest a peristaltic pump. Um, you know, it needs to be a big enough one that the, the tubing can handle, you know, the hops and stuff like that. But it wouldn't have to be very big. Uh, you could pick one off of eBay um, and just make sure that the tubing you're using uh, does not uh, allow uh, oxygen uh, to uh, the oxygen permeable. A lot of people like to choose silicone for things they do in brewing, and they don't realize how very oxygen permeable uh, silicone is. Uh, you're better off with vinyl for your transfers in your silicone. Um, hmm. You will pick up quite a bit of oxygen in silicone. So shame you, of the matter uh, is, it's there is silicone so soft it works great with the pumps. Yeah, but you're you're here advising us that is the wrong material. Yeah, the uh, thank you for that. Uh, there's platinum cured uh, silicone, it's quite expensive. Um, and I've had, you know, thousands of dollars of platinum cured silicone proved to be horrible and allow a ton of oxygen in. I swapped it out with plain vinyl and dropped oxygen on our canning line. Um, so you can't, uh, my experience is you can't trust platinum cured silicone to be uh, really actually the, the right stuff. Um, there's other other tubings, uh, but just make sure if you're going to use a peristaltic pump, that's the case. Any pump you use, you want to make sure, you know, it's not going to pull in a lot of oxygen. You don't want to recirculate a ton of oxygen through. So that's one of the dangers doing it homebrew style. But um, if you can set it up, I, I think it's it's definitely worth doing. Uh, the difference you get in, um, in hop character from, from that is is uh, substantial, I think. Uh, James, he says, um, Travis, give a summary of my low yeah. DO rant. Yeah, the, uh, the sour goot uh, led James to send me a series of messages. Um, <laughs> no. No? I shall not try to summarize James's rant. If you would like to one day invite James on your pedestal here, and allow him to rant on Lodo. That's your business, Jamil. I'm not okay. doing it. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. Uh, let's see here. Um, I need to take another break. Here we go. <laughs> we'll be back right after this. All right, we're back. We're answering your questions live. We actually got uh, a fair, fair amount of questions. And Garth has uh, one more. Where's Blickman? Well, Blickman was just on with Palmer. Garth, are you not keeping up? Clearly, you're you're either not watching live or you're not going back to the archive. Well, actually, it may not, it may not be posted yet. No, it, it's, that was posted. It's on. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, probably with Palmer and their G-string briefs in Florida. Probably with Palmer. Yeah. Get him to design some homebrew uh, recirculation rig for dry <laughs> hmm. Well, what the I new would thing suggest, you guys Garth is you should email uh, feedback at blickmanengineering.com and tell John that you want him to design something so he could you could recirculate uh, the beer and uh, and and explain why that that's the the trend and everybody's going to start doing it and everyone's talking about it and I bet you he he will he will make something um He's uh, he's a clever dude. All right, uh, let's see. Mm, run along. Did not keep up with my breaks. I was enjoying the conversation so much. Uh, all right, we're gonna have to I'm do it. I'm a chat participation today. Yes, which is great. All right, Steve. Steve writes, um, uh, let's see. Uh, damn you all. Here I was happily brewing away mediocre, 
really. I read this. <laughs> yeah. And, and make beer that was good enough. And I'm impressed and impressed my dim witted friends. A fellow brewer turned me on to your show, and now I am second guessing every damn thing I do. What have you done? We just want to help you brew the best beer possible. Bullshit. Now you're all in my head having me listen to podcasts about freaking sanitation on my commute to work. And people in traffic think I'm nuts when I laugh while driving. At least I'm in Elk Grove. So everyone here is either a little nuts or inbred. Thanks again, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dig it, you, Jamil? Yeah. I don't know. I used to live in Elk Grove. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I used to work. Either you're in laughing at him or you're inbred. I'm not sure which, Jamil. <laughs> Uh, I'm definitely nuts. Uh, inbred? Uh, I don't think so. I guess so. Thanks for clarifying. You're but laughing you never, at us. That's cool. You never know. I was. I read that. I was wondering where the where was the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you have the question a question, is, sir. I think the question I pose to you guys is: Does thinking about you know every last little detail actually pay off, or is it is it not worth, you know, is, is the juice not worth the squeeze? Is there too much squeeze going on in home brewing? Or does all that effort actually produce a vastly superior beer? Are you getting more out of that attention to detail than uh, you were before that attention to detail? I mean, how do you compare the beer? Is it is it minimally better? Is it vastly better is is yeah. it definitely worth the effort uh for me it's millions of miles better and i actually have a good homebrew buddy that i talk with about this actually we've talked about it several times is that really the difference between mediocre beer bad beer and some of the best beer that you could get anywhere is i we feel i mean, i agree with it is attention to detail and if anything, homebrewing might do for you as a person, it might help with your attention to detail in other places of your life. So I think it's, I mean, I'm looking for new ways to to streamline and be faster and, and be more, just as accurate and not be overthinking it and, and get kind of uh, analysis paralysis. But at the same time, I have my marks. I really work hard to 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 hit exactly what I wanted and get exactly what I want from the beer and that's a lot of attention to detail. So I, I, I'm with, with that opinion. <laughs> Travis. Yeah. So for me, you know, if you're gifted a craftsman 2000 piece toolbox, you don't have to use it. You know, you don't have to uh, change your head gasket. If you don't want to, you can pay somebody else to do it, but should you want to, you got it. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to. You know, I, I want to make my beer better. I want, I, I want, well, to be honest, I want to be less depressed when I buy commercial beer sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but I want my stuff to stand up to anything commercial. And I get, I get my craftsman tool set from fellas like you, Jamil, from books and stuff, you know, I, I, from doing it over and over and learning from my own mistakes. I like the craftsman tool set that I have to make better beer. Mm -hmm. That's a personal choice, though. Right. And, and I, my last little throw it in there too is I remember listening to all the brew strongs. You've said many a time that you get you get into home brewing to make the best beer possible, and you want to make things that you know you can't get at the store. And I've actually gotten to the point where, I mean, I appreciate homebrew from many other people and 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 my own, and I enjoy it more than store bought stuff. And I, I think that it's just so much more interesting and delicious and fresh and all these things that go into it, but you got to have that attention to detail. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Really does pay off. Uh, all right. Uh, sorry for the quick breaks one after the other, but I just didn't pay attention to the time. All right. We're going to take another short break. And when we come back, we'll wrap up with more of your questions right after this. All right. We're back. We're answering lots of live questions. We're we're catching up on uh, on questions that have been asked, like as of last month. I mean, we're really we're really doing uh, we're really on top of it uh, lately. So, if you have questions for us, 
at Bruce Strong. At, at, you can email Bruce Strong at thebringnetwork.com. And um, the newer questions, I'm, I'm on top of them. We're, we're, we're getting to them. And then we mix in some, some uh, decades old questions because I promised every question would get answered. So uh, there we go. Um, let's, uh, let's do this one from uh, Lee. It says, uh, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no, no. Let's see. Oh, OK. All right. Well, answer this one from Lee. It came in uh, June 9th of 2023. Right, quick enough for you? All right. Sort of. uh, I mean, don't right. expect, if you need like an immediate answer, this is not the form for that, but we will try. Uh, he says, well, I was just about to cancel the two bucks a month that I have donated to the Brewing Network since 2008. But now that Jamel is back, I guess I'm hooked back in. Well, I never went anywhere. It's just there was a month or two. Uh, I was, you know, sitting on the toilet, couldn't couldn't be bothered, couldn't get to the phone. Uh, I've always enjoyed trying to recreate some of the great lagers I have uh, uh, drank in Bavaria and Bamberg region. In regards to low dissolved oxygen proponent and, and homebrewing, does the hot side aeration techniques, including adding metabisulfite matter? FYI, I use a Braumeister that I bought from More Beer. More Beer, excellent, excellent uh, homebrew shop. Uh, probably the best, uh, you know, if you're going to, especially if you're going to order from the internet. Uh, but don't forget to support your local homebrew shop. Even More Beer will tell you that. And if local homebrew shops go out of business, there's not going to be any homebrewing. So you keep supporting your local homebrew shop. You find a way to support them. Uh, I'm always careful to limit my cold side and post-fermentation exposure to oxygen through standard techniques, but I'm wondering if this hot side effort is worth it. Thanks, Lee. And what do you guys think on hot side aeration? Uh, so I actually went back and listened to your Bruce Strong, like I said, with Danforth doing the interview with uh, JP. And it kind of confirmed a lot of things I thought that does hot side aeration affect beer stability the answer is the jury's out, but there's there are these reactions happening that are creating precursors that could cause staling. And then a lot of those things can be fixed with a vigorous, rich, healthy fermentation. Um, I mean, he, he speaks also about uh, vigorous boiling and, and like you said, heat, heat loading or, or uh, mm -hmm. things like that. But Thermal loading. I mean, he said fermentation and then also low DO packaging and temperature control. He gets into a big thing about Arrhenius and, and how the rate equations and, and how you have a doubling of sailing every 10 degrees Celsius. So if you take care of those things and you concentrate on kind of the mountains versus the molehills, you can, mm -hmm. you can really take out a, a big chunk of that possibility for staling. So that's where I, I focus all my work is in Low DO packaging, temperature control of the package beer, and and then I really try to like do my starters and have super healthy oxygenated wort ready to be fermented. Ferment vigorously. Yes, vigorously. Vigorously. So, That's a, a call back to the uh, the lovely Daniela. Oh yeah. The early days. Yeah. So so Michael, that that's my end result, and you, you said. You said something that I think everyone needs to, to think about. Um, and, and, and our gentleman who asked the question, he was talking about the beers of Bavaria. Yes. Which there are some lighter beers in Bavaria, but all your Dunkel Bites and stuff like that come from there. And the one thing I've heard that that is seemingly significant about Lodo, uh, you can make a lighter beer. Okay. But if you don't want to make a lighter beer, you're going to have to add some heat into it to get it back to dark or some other malts. So you're either going to make an entirely different recipe with some darker malts, or you're going to heat stress the piss out of it to get it back to dark again. So if you want to make this pristine pilsner, maybe Lodo is the trick. And, and you know, if you make it and you hand it to me, I'll tell you if it's great or not. But if I'm making the average beer in Bavaria, which is not exactly a pristine pils, I'm not even considering trying to keep the color lighter. That's not my goal. My goal is to make a very good tasting beer that ah, hopefully I can drink it for a while. I mean, 
you've got certain German styles that you brew in March, you drink in October or well, September, right? So you want a stable beer. Color is not the biggest issue. I'm 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 going. I'm not a I'm not a believer necessarily in that. That is a requirement. I'm a believer in that when people tell me they can make a lighter beer, sure. But I make a beer for its taste more than its color. You know, right? Personal opinion. So, um, one of the things that uh, Budweiser does is they have this kind of a waterfall across the cooling. Uh, have a it's like a a wall of uh, chilled plate that the beer cascades down. And they've, they've done this for a long time. And I, I will, you know, you can say all you want about the, uh, the beers of uh, Budweiser, but um, you're not going to say that they're, you know, stale or, you know, a lot of DO or whatever. Um, or darker uh, styles. Right. So I think, and I think, you know, in that episode, uh, Michael, you're referring to, I think Bamforth mentions that possibly. Um, yeah, he does. So, about Budweiser. And yeah, I, I, I don't think hot side aeration is an issue as long as you have a good uh, fermentation, good vigorous fermentation. I think that that really counters that. Um, the, the issue is really more, you know, with, with oxidation and staling or mainly staling of various kinds in uh, a lot of craft beer is that we use these ingredients that have been, um, have had a lot of heat applied to them. Um, you know, the crystal malts and things like that are, are darker base malts have had much more heat applied and that accelerates staling. And it's one of the reasons that you'll find, you know, beers like that, that, that have more of this character tend to be, tend to stale faster. So I think that that's more the issue than uh, hot side aeration. So uh, I, I really wouldn't uh, worry about uh, hot side aeration, Lee. I think there's, you know, like uh, Michael was saying, there's, you know, just focus on the mountains. Don't worry about the, uh, you know, the molehills. Um, and, and, and I would say hot, hot, hot side aeration. Um, yeah, if you can avoid it, you know, great. Uh, but it's definitely a molehill in the, in the pantheon of the mixed metaphors of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, you know, brewing, uh, brewing things. So there, there you go. All right. Um, did I take three breaks yet? Yeah. I think you took three breaks. You took one did. on time, one late, and then one All right. shortly usually, after. Usually I track these things, but uh, today I was feeling <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll tell you what, because we're supposed to keep these shows to an hour, so they, they, they work on somebody's commute. Uh, we're a little bit over time. Uh, so what I'm going to do is end the show here. If you are listening live, please stay tuned. Uh, get your questions ready. You can ask them in the in the uh, in the comments section. If you if you look on Facebook and you listen on Facebook, there's a comments button there. You can click on that our comments link, and uh, that'll take you into the comments. So you can see everybody questions everybody else has asked or comments they've made, and you can ask yours. And we will try to get to them live as we do the shows. We're going to do another show right after this. And so if you're listening live, you get to uh, you get to continue on with us. And if you're listening on the podcast, it's going to be, I don't know, two weeks or so till the next one, something like that. I don't know. But in the meantime, what I want you to do is, uh, you know, if you have equipment ideas, if there's a piece of equipment that you're like, you know, I'd love to see this made. You know, why isn't this made? This is a great idea. Email feedback at BlinkmanEngineering.com and tell them to say, hey, John, I got this idea for a product I want you to, to, to do or something like that, or I think this would be a great idea. Um, if anybody can make it, he can. And, uh, or, you know, just tell him how much you appreciate that he has paid for this show so you don't have to for the last 16 years or however long it's been. Um, someday I'm going to figure out how long it's been. I know I've been talking for more than a thousand hours. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, 
so uh, if you have questions, uh, you know, that you want us to answer, uh, send them in to uh, uh, Bruce Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com. I get all those. I still have every single one of them that was ever sent to us in that way. I, uh, you know, we will, we're, we're, we're hitting the new ones first now and, and getting through them and then mixing in some older ones. Uh, so if you send your question in, we, we will get to it. Uh, it might take a couple of months. So it's not like my house is on fire. What do I do? Don't send us those. <laughs> yeah, right? do that. But, but we're, we're, we're happy to help. And anyway, in five minutes, five minutes, I have to pitch in five minutes really quick. How yeah. much? It's like I'm All brewing right. tomorrow. I get, I do, we do get some questions. I'm brewing tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what, what should I do? You know, I, you know I'm just like, oh. I'm like, man, it's been 13 years, years since this question was asked. <laughs> Every day went well. And I'm like, yeah, I, I feel bad. But, you know, we are going to answer all those questions. So, we, you know, we do. And hopefully people aren't too uh, disappointed with us for, for that. Uh, all right. I guess that's it for this show. Like I said, stay tuned if you're listening live. We will, uh, we will uh, you know, get that out there. And uh, if you want to know when the shows are coming live, I post them to my social media uh, Jay Zanishev on Instagram, Mr. Malty on Twitter, and Jay Zanishev on Facebook. Something like that. I don't know. You see younger, younger people will tell you. All right. You're not until it then, yet. Until You're not then, it out there. Bruce Strong. Bruce, Bruce Strong. Strong.